All right, guys, um, welcome to week four, um, lab four. We are looking at earthquakes. Um, so I finished grading your lab twos. I'm working on your lab threes this week. Um, I should get those done soon. So uh, yeah, let's just uh, get into this lab for earthquakes. Now to kind of uh, recap, um, kind of bring in what we learned last week. Uh, you guys learned about plate boundaries and the three different types. Well, th so those plate boundaries are also what are called faults. And one of the causes of earthquakes are faults. So this should be maybe a little familiar to you. Um, if not, I'll kind of recap. So there's three different types of faults, kind of like how there are three different types of plate boundaries. So if you remember, um, the three different plate boundaries, boundaries were divergent, convergent, and transform. Well, the three different types of faults are kind of are the same in the way they, they have the same stresses. So for example, a normal fault is a divergent boundary. Well, that, those will be found at a divergent plate boundary. And how you, can remember it, how you can remember that is through the types of stresses, they diverge away from each other. So that's a normal fault. And the reverse of that is a reverse, reverse fault. And instead of diverging away from each other, the plates converge on each other. It's, this is compressional stress. So the plates kind of run into each other. And this is found at a convergent plate boundary. And third, I don't know if you, remember, you guys remember this one, this is the, a strike slip fault. And this is found at a transform plate boundary. Uh, one big example would be the San Andreas fault. It's a strike slip fault. Um, so those are the three types of faults uh, that you guys will be looking at for that first for the first part of the lab. I'll go into them a little more, but but yeah. So so a normal fault again. This is when the plates move away from each other. This is um, where the plates or rock units kind of diverge away from each other, and this is caused by extensional stress or extension. And you guys don't really need to memorize the parts of the faults too much, but just uh, just so you know, in a normal fault, the foot wall moves up. And then in the reverse, it, it does the opposite. But right now, in a normal fault, the foot wall goes up the fault line. So one way to kind of help you, help you guys memorize the types of faults is pretty much by their stresses. So if, if your normal fault has extensional stress, um, then the opposite, then the reverse fault, the opposite would be compressional stress. So that's kind of one way to help you guys memorize the different types of faults. So reverse fault, these are found at convergent plate boundaries when the plates converge on each other. And this is, again, the foot wall is just doing, as for the parts of the rocks, the foot wall is just going down, but you don't really need to memorize that as much. And so again, the force that causes this is compression. This is caused by a compressional force, whereas opposed to a normal fault, it's an extensional force. So, um, so again, that's kind of one way I hope that helps you guys memorize it a little easier is your reverse fault has the, is the reverse of a normal. So instead of going out, it's going in. And that's the reverse. That's the reverse of going out. It's going in. And yeah, so what, what causes, so what uh, reverse faults can cause, what convergent, when two plates converge on each other or two rock units converge on each other, they can call the, cause these uh, formations called folds. Now, you guys will look at this in the first few parts of the first few questions of part one. When you're so, when these two rock units converge on each other, when they're going towards each other, when that force is strong enough to move the plates towards each other, 
the rock kind of the rock extending out from that fault from that point of contact that the rock will alter in a way and these one way is through folds and these are the two type of folds you guys will be looking at or looking for i should say in those first few questions now in, in those first few questions i'll uh, i'll draw a diagram real quick you'll have uh, you'll see a um uh, here we go. So you're going to see sand layers kind of start off in these, oh gosh, that was bad. And these uh, just start off horizontally. They'll start off flat and they're not going to look altered at all. So it should be like, it's going to be like sand and then a white layer and then sand again. So that, that's what you guys are going to see originally. And then what you guys will see afterwards is kind of what the question will ask is, you're gonna there it's gonna be compressed so what's gonna happen in the video is Carrie is going to press the the uh, machine I guess he's gonna press it's gonna press it in that direction and so those sand layers right here that you see here these layers are going to alter in a way they are either going to form what's called an anti anticline where the the rock layers kind of well I guess the sand layers in this case kind of fold up or a syncline where they fold down. And that's going to be for you guys to look for. Does it do one or the other or does it do both? Um, so that's what you guys are going to be looking for in part one is how do these rock layers deform? And one way to memorize what is an anti anticline, what is a syncline? Well, when it folds up, when the rock layer folds up, it kind of almost forms up in the shape of an A. And so that forms an anticline. Does that make sense? So like if um, when you start off originally horizontal, then you get, you face that compressional stress is applied. Green was not the color to use. For it. And then you notice the rock starts to fold up and kind of form almost an A shape. That's how you have an anticline. If you notice the rock kind of folds downward, almost like a dip. That's how you have a syncline. And syncline is just the opposite of an anticline. So that's one way to kind of memorize um, the types of folds is, you know, anticline A, syncline not, or the opposite of an A. And so you just have a few questions uh, pertaining to that, but, but yeah, so those are the only two folds you're gonna be looking at, which are caused by reverse faults. Let me go back. which are caused by compression, by reverse faults. So that's, again, that's for the uh, first part of the, of the lab. And then the last type of, of fault is called a strike-slip fault. And so this is the St San Andreas fault. This is just when the two plates rub along each other. And the plate boundary that, the type of plate boundary this is found out is a transform. So this type of stress, you, so we looked at, Compressional stress, shear, uh, extensional stress, and now the third type of stress is shear stress. And so hopefully that'll kind of help you um, memorize which types of uh, faults are caused by which types of stresses. So let me just do a quick recap. So a normal fault, a normal fault is extensional stress. Normally the plates extend. Reverse. Reverse fault is just the reverse of that. The plates go towards each other. And then a strike slip fault is just when they rub along each other through, through shear stress. So those are your three faults, normal, reverse, and then strike slip. And your three types of stresses are extension, compression, and shear. So hopefully that kind of helps a little bit. And, um, and it stresses, it's these, uh, pretty much the friction at these, at these faults is what cause earthquakes. So that's the last part of the faults. Next, we're going to go into something called uh, PNS wave. So let me just kind of exit out here. So now this is going to be a little different from the, the faults. Uh, this is just on how to, on how scientists read 
how they read seismographs essentially and how they analyze earthquakes, how they are able to re, uh, interpret data from earthquakes. So I'm gonna show you this video and this video is also on the PowerPoint so you guys will be able to watch this video at your own leisure. You can watch it as many times as you want. I think it does a good job of kind of explaining what S and P waves are on a seismograph. So I'm gonna play that real quick. Now you guys don't need to worry about each seismogram station, um, but it's just interesting to know, but I'll pause it again to show you what parts I want to focus on, but yeah. All right, so this kind of shows you the three types of, of waves on a seismograph. And so you guys, again, can watch this at your own leisure, but it's just kind of give you a visual onto how the seismogram works. So again, so this is what it's essentially measuring. Um, and this is another video about, about waves, which you guys can watch um, if, you, if you'd like. But, but yeah, so, so kind of picking back off what that video said, the last part, um, part five, uh, is going to sh you're going to pretty much read a seismogram. And also a side note, um, I don't know if you guys noticed there's no part four. We decided to get rid of it because there was a problem with the, with, uh, with the methods and how it was gonna work. So there's no part four, it's, it just goes straight to part five. But so back to this. So. So you guys are going to be reading a seismograph and you're going to try to take away two pieces of information from it to find this magnitude here. So what you're looking at, let's start with this graph right here, this, this seismogram here. So how, you're, how you distinct, so how, how you're able to find uh, the P wave and the S wave is going to essentially be by the peaks, the peaks and valleys in the graph. So for example, let's see. so here, as you see on this graph, the beginnings of these like medium, small to medium size waves, they start 
as denoted on the graph here, which is your P wave. So the fir your first wave of, that, of any, your first activity is your P wave. And using the, pretty much the time scale at the bottom here, that's how you, you find the time it starts. They're saying it starts at 0.7 seconds. You guys don't need to be super specific, but that's how you're gonna try to read the time is look at the beginning of the activity. So pretty much look for the beginning of zigzags on the seismograph. And you're gonna look down and find the time where it starts. So hopefully that makes sense. And so that's how you're gonna get the time of your P wave arrival, the time your P wave starts. And so next, you're going to wanna to find the start of your S waves. Your S waves are gonna be much bigger. They're gonna have much you know, taller peaks and much lower valleys. So for example, you keep following along these, these peaks and valleys, they seem to stay within a range, um, nothing great, nothing huge, nothing egregious, nothing terrible. And then you notice, boom, right here is the start of a large dip, a very increased dip. And so that's the start of your S waves right there. That was really bad, but yeah. So, so that's the start of your bigger uh, zigzags, if you will, on your seismograph. And then you define the time of that. Again, just look down. And if you reference, if you go down here on the chart, they say it's 8.7. So, so yeah, so now that you have the start of your P wave at 0.7 seconds, the start of your S wave at 8.7 seconds, now you can find uh, something called your lag time, which is right here. So this is gonna be one of your questions is, you're gonna try to find lag time. And what your lag time is, is gonna be your, the time, so the time you get for your S wave, right here, which is always gonna be larger, and you're gonna subtract from that the time of your P wave. So in this case, we would have 8.7 minus 0.7 to get a lag time of eight seconds. So does, does that make sense? Hopefully, let me see if I can, there's a different letter here. So here, so we got our S time here. Um, again, it says 8.7. This is hard to write with, but there. And then you have your P wave time, which is 0.7. And so to get your lag time, you're just gonna get the difference of the two. And it should always be positive. It, it, should, it shouldn't be negative. So you're just gonna do 8.7 minus 0.7. And that's going to give you a lag, a lag time of eight seconds. So that's what you guys are going to try to look for. Um, again, it's going to be the start of your smaller zigzags. So where do your smaller zigzags start? And you're going to follow that up until where do your smaller zigzags end and your bigger zigzags start? So, and, and that's pretty much, that's pretty much it. You're pretty much recording. You're going to pretty much record the time your small zigzags start, and then you're gonna keep going along the along the, uh, the seismogram and look for the start of your bigger zigzags. And you should get two times, and the difference between those two times is your lag time. All right, so now, so we'll use this graph as a reference for the next part. So here your P is labeled, your S is labeled clearly, um, we'll start, we'll get that in a second. Next thing you're gonna find is something called the amplitude. And that's pretty much going to be the, your largest reading, your largest peak, if you will, on your seismogram. And it's usually gonna be an S wave. So we're gonna use this graph for reference and we're gonna look, we'll try to find the amplitude. So if we look here, the tallest peak on this, graph starting from the starting from the baseline here starting from the p these peaks aren't that tall we keep going up and then we follow it to the s now we definitely see taller peaks and we notice here this is the tallest peak right here 
So that's what you guys are going to look for when finding amplitude. You're going to look for the tallest peak on the graph. And to find the peak, it's going to be kind of how you see on this graph here. If you see on the side of the graph here, you see a number, like numbers here to the side. That's, what, that's how you guys are going to read it too. You're going to find the reference on the side and pretty much kind of correlate the, the, large, the tallest peak, the reading to the tallest peak to the number on the side of the graph, which in this case they say is 23. And so that's your amplitude is 23 for this graph. So your amplitude is just the reading of the tallest peak on your seismograph. So again, hopefully that makes sense. Uh, if you want another example, if we go back to this graph here on the right, the tallest peak is right here on this graph. And if we follow it over, it's just above two. I guess I can draw it all the way, it doesn't matter. We can follow it over to the key here to the left. You see it's just above two and they mark it at 2.7. Um, and so that, that'd be the amplitude of, of that graph, um, on that graph, seismograph. So that's how you find amplitude and then log time. Now, the third thing you guys are gonna look for is something called magnitude, which is right here in the middle. So this part might get a little confusing, but I'm gonna try to walk you through it. So let's stick here to the graph on the left. So we have our amplitude here. So actually, let me back up. So this is also in your lab. So you have, you're gonna have three bars for reference here. Your first bar here to the left is your distance and your time. Um, you don't need to calculate distance right now, you're just gonna use time, but the time pretty much gives you distance. Then all the way to the far right, you have your amplitude, which you can read from the graph. And actually I'll mark it right here. It said our amp, our, our amplitude was 23. That was our tallest peak, was 23 millimeters. And so now we're gonna use those two points to find magnitude. And for this one, well, let's find our, our lag time. I know it's given here, but let's, let's find it. So again, uh, as I previously stated, your lag time is the difference between your first P wave, so your first small zigzag, subtracted from the time of your first big zigzag or your S wave. And so we'll say uh, this is one, we'll say this is one second right here, that, that uh, the P wave started at one second. And we'll say the S wave started at 25 seconds. Okay, so again, just to kind of back up, we looking at this graph, we'll see the P wave starts at one second and the S wave starts at 25 seconds. And so the difference between that would be 24 seconds. As they say right here. So now we have our lag time, 24 seconds. We have our amplitude, our tallest peak at 23 millimeters. Now we're gonna find our magnitude. So as you can see here in the red, I marked our, um, our amplitude in millimeters. Now I'm going to, using the, the far left bar here, I'm going to mark our time in seconds. And which is 24 seconds, which is about here. I'll make it green. And now you're gonna use, pretty much connect these two points and find the magnitude. So uh, to explain is you're going to pretty much either draw a, so I'll draw for you. I'll, you're gonna draw a direct line and where the line crosses that magnitude bar, uh, that's where, that's gonna be your magnitude. So let me get a yellow line. So it doesn't matter where you start, you just wanna connect the, the point on the bar of your amplitude, you're gonna connect that to your time. And at the point on, on the bar where it crosses your magnitude, that's gonna be the magnitude. And, and in this case, it looks like it's about five. You just say five. So that's how you guys are gonna do it. And if you guys wanna make it easier, you can use a piece of paper and kind of put it up against the screen and reference the two points and see where it crosses 
the, uh, the magnitude bar to get your magnitude reading. All right, so again, hopefully that makes sense. I know it might be a little confusing at first, um, but just again, just, uh, just message me or let me know if, if it's still a little confusing, but it, it should be, again, pretty straightforward. Worst case scenario, just try to just look for your tallest peak. What is, what is the reading of your tallest peak when you go all the way to the left? So, if, so when you see your tallest peak, just get that number. And if you get the number of your tallest peak, next, just get your time of your P wave. So the time of your first small zigzag, the time of your last small zigzag, and get that difference. And then pretty much connect the dots here. So we'll actually do the left graph, the, or sorry, the graph to the right as another example. Now again, everything's given here. Uh, we found that our lag time, the difference between P and S waves, was eight seconds. And as they labeled up here, the maximum amplitude, your tallest peak, was is 2.7 right there. So now we can find our magnitude. So we have our difference here. So 8.7 minus 0.7 is eight seconds. That's our time. Let's go mark that. Uh, here's eight seconds right here. And then we have our amplitude. And so we can mark that on the amplitude graph right here. They say 2.7, so it, it's probably about right here. All right. So now we have our our, uh, la our log time, our lag time here to the left. We have our amplitude here to the right. If we draw a line directly across, it's going to cross the magnitude at about, that is a terrible line, but it's gonna cross at about 3.25. And so that would be our magnitude for this graph, 3.25. And so that's, again, that's what you guys are gonna do for that last part, is find your tallest peak and then find the difference in time of your P wave and S wave. And pretty much just draw a line from those two points and see where it crosses your magnitude. And you guys don't need to be super specific on the magnitude number. Um, like just, you know, 3.25 would be fine for the, this answer or, you know, 3.5 or 3. Point, like you could do it in 0.25 increments. It doesn't need to be super exact. Just, you know, 0.25 increments to make it easier. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, if you're still confused on how to find either lag time, amplitude, or anything, mag or, or magnitude, just let me know and I can, I can, I can do a, another video explaining this even further. Um, or I could just talk to you one-on-one -on -one to help explain to you more. And now just one last note. Um, this is mainly for jumping back to part one. Um, it's uh, so for the, for part one, you're going to have to take a picture of a few sketches and then attach them. That might be kind of weird, but um, hopefully it works when you're drawing uh, the layers. Um, and, and again, that's tying back to the, uh, you know, for the, the different type of faults. So when you're, you're going to see a bunch of different layers, but they're going to be perfectly horizontal. When you're drawing them, try to draw them to scale. So at the start of the video, um, you'll see, uh, like a ruler laid out for how long that, that rock unit is and how tall it's going to be. Um, and it should be in centimeters try to draw it to scale. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be one for one. I know you're not an artist. I'm not an artist, but it just, just try to draw it the best you can as in terms of a rough sketch. And also try to draw the difference in layers. Um, you're going to see sand, then a white layer, then sand again. Uh, this is just one way to draw it to denote sand. You can just shade in that part and then draw a space for the white layer. And then the top layer, draw more sand and that, that can make it easier. And you should have three layers in total. So sand, no sand, sand. Um, you could do dots to represent the sand or something. It doesn't matter. Just, just try to draw something to kind of denote the different layers, if that makes sense. 
and, and those are videos for those questions. So you can watch them again. You can pause them if you need to, um, to kind of help go at your own speed. All right, so that's pretty much everything for this lesson. Um, I know it's a little, it's a little more than the previous labs, but um, hopefully this PowerPoint helps and hopefully this video lecture helps. Again, please, please uh, email me, message me on Canvas if you have any questions or, or concerns or if there's something you don't understand. Um, I, I know some of you, uh, you, you just, uh, I reached out to you and you guys said you are you completely lost. So you, you, that's why you turned in, you know, like an English cleaner assignment or something. Just again, just reach out to me before you do that. If you have any concerns, I, 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 I can at least try to help you. And at least kind of help you try to help you understand something if if you if you have any confusions. So again, please don't be afraid to reach out. Um, I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. Um, if you want, we can do a, a a Zoom call to help you clarify something in person if that helps better, um, or just anything. Again, please feel to, feel free to reach out. I know this is kind of a lot to to kind of learn at first. Um, but hopefully this helps. So other than that, uh, good luck and hope you guys have a good rest of the week. So yeah.